psalm written in the third person plural, uh, we, our, and so forth. Uh, and of course, the theme of the psalm is the security of the people of God. The security of the people. That's a, that's a, that's a theme of the psalm, but I'm going to pick up two words in the psalm as a challenge to our hearts this morning. The Bible says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, <laughs> and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. Selah. There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Mosai. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her and that right early. The heathen raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Come, behold the works of the Lord. What desolations he had made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease under the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. There are many things, that, there are many things said about God in this chapter. As a matter of fact, there are many things said about God. I don't know if you notice how many times the word God is mentioned. Uh, the name God, the word God is repeated. Verse 1, God is our refuge. Verse 4, God of the, uh, the city of God. Verse 5, God is in the midst of her. Uh, verse 5, God shall help her out right early. Verse number 7, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Verse 8, um, come behold the works of the Lord. And then down in verse number 10, be still and know that I am God, and then verse 11, the Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge. I don't know how many times, obviously you notice how many times the word God is mentioned. This is one of the Psalms that begins with the word God. And there are many things said in the Psalm about God. The Psalm speaks about God's protection in verse 1. God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. That speaks of God's Protection. Do you believe that God can protect us? Amen. Of course he can. He has been doing that. Amen. And he is our protection. And God, and you know, this psalm was possibly a psalm that Israel used to console themselves at times of great, at times of great peril. Uh, when they were in danger, they would read or sing this psalm. This psalm was possibly sung at the time when uh, Shennacherib invaded Israel. As some of you remember the story in 2 Kings chapter 19. When Hezekiah was placed in this very difficult position when the threats came from Sennacherib that, um, you know, it doesn't make sense even believing in God or trusting God. Uh, uh, the, the king of Assyria has conquered all the nations so far and Israel is going to be another piece of cake, so to speak. And just to kind of... Uh, paraphrase and when Hezekiah heard those words he was troubled he was he was literally trembling and he sent to get Isaiah to pray he says here's the here are the words of Shennacherib and, and we need to pray and Isaiah said you know what go back and tell the king that Shennacherib is going to hear some kind of, of a rumor and he's going to go back into his land and there in his land he's going to be destroyed and God is <laughs> amazing oh God delivered them so that was a psalm of consolation, a psalm of comfort that, that, that described the security of God's people, in, even in the midst of trouble. So this particular psalm has three stanzas. Each of them ends with sila. The first stanza ends in verse 3, and the second stanza ends in verse 7, and the, of course the last stanza ends in verse 11. Notice that sila, every time you hear sila, it means just rest and think about what you've just read. Just calm yourself down and think about the God who has given these words. So we read the first, the first three verses. God is our refuge and strength. So there are many things said in the psalm about God. God's protection. But it also speaks of God's peace. In verse 2 and 3. Therefore will not we fear. 
Though the earth be removed, though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. The, the, the psalmist says, we won't fear. We, we, we're going to believe God. Let me ask you a question. What does it take to cause you to fear and not obey God? You think about it a little bit because storms reveal the hearts of people. Troubles reveal the heart. Not just physical storms, but spiritual storms in the lives of God's people. Troubles reveal the heart of God's people. What will you, who will you trust and who will you, who will you fear in the midst of a storm? It's amazing. I've been looking at how people responded to the, the news. Uh, they were even threatening. As a matter of fact, I think they announced that stores can open this morning to allow people to get supplies. Imagine going on Sunday morning to buy plywood. And you had all of yesterday. It goes to show, my friend, how easily people can dismiss the day of God and the church of God and the things of God. And the fear comes because they listen to the news. The Bible tells me here, the psalmist says, listen to this. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed. Now, I tell you what, if you know Christ as your Savior, even though the earth is removed, God says, you have no reason to fear. You know, fear is a crippling thing. Fear is a damaging thing. Fear, fear, fear reveals the absence of faith. And Satan is the master of fear. Fear. I'm afraid. And God says no. Even though I move the earth. Even though I move the mountains and carry them into the sea. Though the waters thereof roar. Yeah, you, you, you remember what happens when storm comes in here. And the, the waterfront over there is all roaring. The seven mile beach turned upside down. God says. David says here in the psalm. I will not fear because God's peace controls me in the midst of the storm. Though the waters thereof row and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. And the word sila means, okay, even mountains are shaking and storms are raging. God says you can just sit down and think of the God of peace. Sila. What does it take to stop you from serving God? A storm, an illness, a criticism. What does it take to stop you from serving God? Troubles test the hearts of the people of God. Difficulties test the hearts of the people of God. It tests my heart. What would stop me from serving God? Let me turn with me. Turn, well, I, don't, I shouldn't leave the text. I want to get into it. Because, but I just wanted to refer to you a scripture that Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians. As he talked about the troubles that he endured. Fastings, prisons, beatings, mockings, hatred. And yet this man of God was able to plod on. Faithful to the end. To the point where he comes in 2 Timothy and he says, I have fought. A good fight. I have kept the faith. I have finished the course. I have. Now is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Nothing could stop the apostle Paul. Think about a man. He said in storms often shipwrecks. And, 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 and hatred and brothers and beatings and left for dead. And yet Paul said I know who I believe. Uh, and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him until that day. What stops you from serving? What keeps you from serving God is the measure and how much we love him. The Bible says, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, all thy soul, all thy mind, all thy strength. The first and great commandment, to love God, to love God with everything I have. So if the first commandment is to love God with all I had, obviously the greatest sin is to disobey the first commandment. What does it take to stop? A storm? An illness? 
The Bible reveals many things in the psalm about God, God's protection, God's peace. But it also talks about God's place. Verse 4 and 5. There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God. And that's interesting because, you know, Jerusalem has no rivers. You didn't get that? There are no rivers running through Jerusalem. And yet this text is telling me there is a, there is a, there is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God. The holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. In other words, God is saying, whatever you need, Whatever you need, I'm there to supply. As a matter of fact, you sense your need. We sense our need of God best when there is a lack. You see, because, Israel, because Jerusalem had no river, then the people of God has to depend upon God to supply the streams in the desert. God said, I'm going to be your river. I'm going to be your supply. I'm going to meet your need. I am Jehovah Jireh. So what you need most, I want to let you know I have it to provide for you. And it's amazing, this text, it speaks of God's place, God's protection, God's peace. Brothers and sisters, there's a place. I don't know, God is everywhere, but yet God has chosen places to manifest his presence in and to dwell in. Now I know right now he dwells in our hearts as believers. But he's also designated places on the earth. Where the brethren, those in whom he dwells, he gathers. There's a place for God. And I want to be in the place where God wants me to be. When it's time to be in the place that God wants me to be. Because God has a place. God's place. God's place. What troubles can keep me from God's place? And the psalmist says, there is a place, there is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God. The city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Mosai. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her on that right early. The place where God dwells is where I want to be. Amen. You see, fear can keep the people of God from the place of God. There are many things said about God. God's protection, God's peace, God's place. But it also talks about God's power. In verse 6, the heathen rage, the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice, the earth melted. That's the power of God. God says, a little storm can match my power. I could speak and the earth will melt. And one day he's going to speak and the earth will melt. The Bible says God reserved the earth under fire. So what we're saying is this. There's, there's, there's nothing, my friend, nothing that you and I can face in this world that God's power is not, a bit, is not able to overcome and deal with. So he says, I could speak the power. He said, I want, you to I want to comfort the people of God. I want you to show the security of the people of God. God's protection, God's peace, God's place, God's power. But it also talks about God's presence in verse 7 and 11. Look at it. The Lord of hosts is with us. And I know I, haven't, I have not given you the topic yet, the title of the message that I'm going to give you in a minute. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. And then in verse 11, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. It talks about God's presence. He's with us. He's with us. Some of you remember Ivan. You remember where you were during Ivan. I remember where I was in Ivan. You can't forget that stuff. Now the little ones don't quite remember. And for those who are not here during that time or have ever been through a storm, uh, they don't really know what, 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 what that feels like. But I remember very well as, if, as the winds raged for about 12 hours over Grenada. And you hear the roof of your house creaking with stress as it, it feels like it's going to move. And there we had a one-year-old baby in the house, Micaiah. And two young children, a wife.
And guess what we started to do? If you don't pray, then something wrong with you. Oh God, please keep this roof on the house. I know you're with us. As the winds howled and the noise and the banging of things flying all around the place. God, I know you're with us. Please, oh God, please, don't let this roof come off. And yes, indeed, when I got up the next morning, one of the few roofs in our neighborhood that was on the building was ours. And I'm not talking about Little homes where we live had very, very big homes and um, very expensive homes. And our house was under construction. We were not quite done with it. We were living in it. And the houses that were completed and well built, we thought. The walls were standing there and the people walking around looking for some water. The church where we had church at that time, the roof was gone completely. Everything crashed in and the whole place was a mess. And the one house in our neighborhood, and we lived out on a peninsula on the ocean, the full blast of the wind. And um, the one house, the roof, you don't, God, listen my friend, God can still answer prayer. His presence, I felt his presence with us that day. I can never forget when I went out during, this, during the eye of the storm to board up a door that was broken out. I ran upstairs, you know, upstairs and I tried to nail up the boards. A big old piece of ch uh, plywood I had out there and tried to block the wind from coming in that house. During the little calm of the storm, the eye passed right over Gideon. And I said, you know what I'm going to try to do? I left my wife and children inside the house and I there up there with my hammer trying to nail that thing out there by myself. And while I'm out there, the wind picked up from the other direction. And I ran downstairs to the front door and the door was locked. And I'm banging on the door to my wife, open the door, please. God. She forgot that I was out there. <laughs> But God, oh God, that's why I, I understand a little bit, brothers and sisters, of the presence of God. He gives peace in the midst of the storm. He does. I understand some of you here went through some terrible things with flooding. We didn't have that problem so much in Grenada. It's very mountainous. But here I understand some folks went through some horrible, horrible, horrible situations of flooding and water up halfway up into your homes and the scare and the fear. And I remember calling came in to find out. We were calling to find what happened to her mother. That part at the time, my wife's calling. And every time you call, there's just this... This bing on the phone, no answer, no answer, no answer. And we heard that Cayman was completely underwater. That's what we heard. And I said, well, probably they're all drowned, they're all dead. And finally, we heard a voice when we called one time, and there's somebody answered. And they're thinking we're dead, they, we think they're dead. But God, the presence of God is an amazing thing in a church. When a child of God can have the peace, sensing the nearness of God. And three times in the psalm, uh, two times in the psalm, it says the Lord of hosts is, a matter of fact, three times because in verse one it says, God is our refuge and strength, a very, what? Present help in trouble. Present help in trouble. Do you know who kept the roof on the house? It's not the carpenters and the masons who built it. You know? It was God. Because if there was any roof that should have left our, it's all our, our roof. Because the house was still under construction. And I could see people the next day driving down. Looking to see if it's on. Because their roof is gone. To check the seat, Pastor Jeremiah is gone. 
But there's a God in heaven, church. And that allowed us to meet in that house for six months. We had the church six months in the hot side of the house. Until God provided another place. The presence of God. This psalm talks about God's protection, God's peace, God's place, God's power, God's presence. But it also talks about God's punishment. In verse 8 and 9. Come, behold the works of the Lord. What desolations he had made in the earth. And he's talking about the destruction of the Antichrist and all that. When God's going to put all these things to, to, to an end. He make it wars to cease unto the end of the earth. And break it, notice that, break it the bow. And cut it the spearing sun that burned the chariot in the fire. Now, here's my series of topic. Do you know that all that we just said about God, his protection, his peace, his place, his power, his presence, his punishment. Do you realize that they will never become personal and applicable to us until we obey this key command in the text? Be still. Be still. God's protection. You know why people worry and fear? They don't have God's peace. They never have any respect for God's place. They never experience God's power. They never really sense God's presence. They have no clue of God's punishment. Although it's in the text, you know why? They're not still. They're not still. You know, God speaks in a still, small voice. The Bible says, be still, and what will happen? You will know that I am God. Did you see that? Be still and know that I am God. Yesterday was not a day I was still, to be honest with you. I was trying to run around and make sure we get church done. We're worried about it this year, the computer here, that stuff, that window there, that door there, that water. And yeah, I understand we got to do what we can to protect the property. But to be honest with you, church, sometimes in the Christian life, we lose our focus on the Lord and sort of drift around spiritually. No real passion, no real pleasure in his service. And here the Bible says in this psalm, in the stillness, in the stillness, we get to know his person. Not, not just his protection, his peace, his place, his power, his presence, his punishment, but we get to know his person. Be still and know that I am God. The word still is an interesting word. And that's topical. That's the topic of my message this morning. Just encourage your hearts. Be still. The word still is an interesting word because the word still, be still, is one, actually one, one verb, one command. Be still. It's the Hebrew word rafa. Rafa. And you know rafa is one of the endings of one of Jehovah's name, the name of Jehovah. Jehovah rafa, I'm the Lord that healed thee. Be still is a word that means to slacken, to abate. When he says, I'm the Lord thy God that healeth thee, I'm the one that abates your illness. I cause it to cease. It means to consume, to draw, like drawing towards the evening. To be faint, to be feeble, to forsake, to let idle. Put yourself spiritually, in neutral. God said. Put yourself in a spiritual neutrality and you will know God. And then you'll be able to fully apply his protection, his peace, his place, his power, his presence, punishment. But it won't happen in the noise while you're in gear. 
while you're in gear and while I'm in gear with my own agenda, I never know God. Be still, Rafa. God. And he used the word God here, Elohim, the word we have found in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. It's what we call the uniplural word implying the triune nature of God. Genesis 1, 26, 27. Or he's saying the strong one, I'm the strong one. It's used about 2,500 times in the Old Testament alone. God, be still and know that I am Elohim. I am the strong one. I am the God of your protection. I am the God of your peace. I am the God that's in the place where you would meet me. I am the God of power. I am the God whose presence you can sense and know. I am the God of punishment as well. I will deal with your enemies. But you got to put yourself in spiritual neutrality. No. Spiritual. Know him personally. Jehovah. Jehovah. How do you be still? You ever ask yourself a question? I mean, we read it often. But how do, how do we get still? Well, I believe, number one, we, we can be still as to words or accusations. Don't, don't, don't speak against God's plan or God's providence or God's program. Be still. Anytime a child of God begins to rage against God's providence and God's program and God's plan, he's not still. He's accusing God of not being fear. Why me, Lord? You ever heard that? Why me? Why not you? Why not me? God, this isn't fair. I'm trying to serve you and this is what I get. Never speak against God's plan or God's providence. Do you know that if God allowed this storm to destroy the Cayman Islands, that that is his plan? Do you know that sometimes God needs to send things like that to get the attention of people? I remember after Ivan, people were crying. The churches were filled after Ivan. I mean, people were there. They, oh God, please, please. They had no water home. They had no clothes. They had no food. They had all over the place with blue tarps on the houses and people in church. I remember one Sunday morning, we had almost a almost hundred people inside the house. And then as they began to cover the houses. And as they got their cars out of the water. And as the homes began to be repaired. And you could go back to the supermarket and just buy stuff. The attendance began to, began to wane. Why aren't you in church? Well, pastor, you know, I had to work. God sometimes sends storms, church, to wake up people and to remind them that he's God. Stormy winds fulfill his word. So wherever God puts this storm, are we praying that it's, you know, it doesn't come to us? But God may have a purpose in allowing it to come through and remind some people that your material possessions is literally zero when it comes to your spiritual life. I wish people would prepare for God like we preached last Sunday as they prepare for her again. I mean, I looked out there in, in E.L. Thompson trying to find some things and, um, yesterday and the place was full. I thought it was Black Friday. They're shopping. They're back. And you wonder, where, where, where does the money come from in times like these? You ever, you ever wonder that? Then come to church and give a dollar in the offer. I'm not saying I'm, I'm not saying you do that, but I mean people everywhere. I'm seeing people. Hey, pastor, how are you doing? I'm like, I'm, I'm I'm okay. I'm trying to fix up myself. Oh, yes, yes, yes. We all day, all and some even this morning. I understand we have to prepare. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying don't prepare for a storm, but how about the fact that Jesus Christ has been saying for two thousand years He's coming back? 
But ain't nobody concerned about his protection, his peace, his place, his power, his presence, and his punishment. God says, it's time to go into spiritual neutrality and be still. And you know what? A storm usually gets people still. You know why? They have to shelter in place. They have to stay home without electricity. And so they may have some moments to think about God. Amen, church? Think about the master of the sea. We as a song, we used to sing, I know the master of... You know that song? I know the maker of the wind. And he could calm the storm. Let the sun shine again. I know the master of the rain. Well, the question is, how do I be still? Be still as to your words. Don't ever speak against God's plan, God's program, God's people, God's providence. In other words, cease murmuring. If God sends a storm, we thank him for it. If he, take, if, if he does not send it, we thank him. Amen? Be still as to your words. Words are usually the first evidence of a disturbed heart. From the abundance of the heart, a man speaks. Number two. Be still as to action. I, I know be still sometimes means sit down and not do anything. That, that's, 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 that's included, but I, it's more than just sitting down and not doing anything. You can sit down and not think about God. But when the Bible says be still and know that I am God. Be still as to accusations against God. Be still as to actions. Be careful not to oppose God in our outward behavior. Still. We could say something and then our actions oppose God and the way we behave. We could say, oh, oh, I love Jesus. Oh, I love Jesus. But never read the Bible. Never pray. Never be in the house of God. Never, never, never serve. God says, be still as to your actions. Be careful that your outward behavior does not oppose God. Number three, I believe we can be still as to attitude. That now speaks of the quiet, calm frame of mind and heart. To be submissive to whatever God's divine pleasure might be for you. Say, God, I don't quite understand this. But I have an attitude that I will be quiet, I will be calm in my heart and mind I will be submissive to your divine pleasure. Whatever that might be for me. And that, that, that's the Apostle Paul. Whatever God sent him, sent him. Thy will be done, Lord. Oh, my friend. Stillness of attitude is probably one of the most difficult to cultivate. A quiet Calm frame of mind and heart. And then be still as to your aspiration. Why is it a child of God must learn to be still? The only way faith can develop. It's when I'm still as to my aspirations. God says be still and know that I am God. My greatest aspiration, my greatest aspiration is to know God. It should be to know who he is. And the measure of our problems is always related to the measure of our attitude or our appreciation of who God is. If God is a big God, our problems are small. If God is a small God, our problems are big. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Be still in my aspirations. The only way faith can develop 
is when a child of God quietly sits in front of this book and allow the divine word of God to develop faith in God. For the Bible says without faith, it is what? Impossible to please him. So although the text tells us many things about God, We'll never personally apply those things about God until we know God. And the only how to know God is to be still as to accusation. Still as to action. Still as to attitude. And still in my aspiration. That's a command of God to a child of God. And God gave that command in the midst of trouble. Still. When last, in the busy, busy schedule of the Cayman Islands, did we actually take some time on hurried time? Where you're not looking at something coming up. You don't, have, you don't have a time to finish. I just sat down with God and said, God, I, I just want to quiet my heart before you. I want your peace. I don't want to accuse you. I want to have an aspiration that I want to know you. Paul said it this way, that I may know him. And the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering. The crisis of the moment, church, is to know God. Not about God. That's an issue. We know a lot about him. But as I said, the psalm talks about him. But those things that are about him will not become practical and personal until you know him. And there is no shortcut to knowing God. He says, put yourself in spiritual neutrality for a moment and let God be God. Be still. 